Good morning and welcome back to the 2022 Ligonier National Conference. I'm Nathan W. Bingham and we're eager to keep thinking about this year's conference theme, Upholding Christian Ethics. We live in a world that is in open rebellion against its holy creator. And as Christians who are justified by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, we must resist the influence of the world and by God's grace wrestle with the remaining sin in our own hearts. So I hope this conference has been a benefit to you so far and has encouraged you to dig deeper into God's word. Remember, you can watch all of yesterday's messages again in the free Ligonier app. Just visit ligonier.org app or search for Ligonier in your app store of choice. Now we begin today's live teaching with a message from Dr. Harry Reader on the topic of gender and sexuality. We're crossing now to Ligonier's president and CEO, Chris Larson, to introduce Dr. Rita. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father and our God, we do come to you, Lord, with hearts that are expectant, Lord, to hear more from your word today. Lord, you have fed us so richly. Thank you for yesterday. Thank you for the message of the cross that was preached so powerfully last night, and that in Jesus Christ, he is our hope and our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that binds us together in love by your Spirit. We thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy and the encouragement that we can share, meeting friends, uh, meeting new friends. Uh, and we pray that you would even form lasting lifetime friendships from this weekend because we are united in the truth. Help us this day, Lord. Help those who preach and teach and be with us. and. Unite our hearts to be able to sing your praise with clarity, with boldness, and to proclaim and teach and defend your holiness in all of its fullness for your glory alone. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. It is a delight to be back for day two of the Ligonier National Conference. I do hope you paced yourself yesterday because today's the long day. And uh, we do have so much teaching uh, to get to today, and we are so eager uh, to be able to share this time together. Do let others know about what is happening here. Uh, let them know uh, how they can listen to something that you heard. You can share it um, and be able to provide continued teaching uh, for those in your circle. We like to say, you know far more people than we do. And so we love to be able to put this teaching in your hands so that you can spread it around, spread it around the world. Our teacher this morning is a dear friend of the ministry and served alongside of Dr. Sproul for uh, many years. Uh, and Dr. Harry Reeder has been used of the Lord to become one of the leading voices within the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, he has served for uh, many years as senior pastor at Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And of course, any of you who know of that church and its long and faithful history within the PCA uh, know what kind of stewardship that Dr. Reeder has had over the years and the care that he has brought to continuing to further the mission work of that church for the blessing of the Southeast, of the denomination, but truly around the world. Uh, Dr. Reader can be heard on radio broadcasts. Uh, you can even hear him on RefNet. Um, and uh, you've also heard a little bit of our outreach to inmates. Well, Dr. Reader, through Birmingham Theological Seminary and their church there at Briarwood, they have been working with inmates in correctional facilities throughout the Southeast. And they've really just been doing this for years and years and years. And the stories that they can tell about the revival and people coming to Christ uh, who are incarcerated, that work has been an encouragement to us. And we've sought ways that we can now continue to partner and serve them uh, with Ligonier Resources as well. So that's a, a fairly new relationship uh, that's just begun between the two ministries. But Dr. Reeder, uh, he is a trusted voice. And these are precarious times in many churches and in many denominations, and denominations that have historically stood for 
the truth of the gospel and confidence in the supremacy and authority and sufficiency of God's word, now it seems that those foundations are crumbling and eroding away. And Dr. Reeder has been a voice for the truth, trying to bring the light and reminding the church to put their confidence in the word of God and to not bend to shifting tides and opinions as they uh, beset us. Uh, we are in tumultuous times, and we need clear and bold leadership, and Dr. Reeder has provided that. I would point you to one of his resources that we have in our bookstore on leadership. It's called 3D Leadership, where you can understand how to define, develop, and deploy Christian leaders who can change the world. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Harry Reeder? Well, it's great to be with you. If you'll get your copies of God's Word, we, we don't have uh, lots of time. We want to be on time. In fact, you probably notice this place runs pretty much on time. And uh, I asked them, how will I know when my time's up? They gave me the, uh, the clock system and said, when it goes red, you're in trouble. And um, I said, well, what happens? I was reminded of the story that... Uh, of the man that pastored a church and it grew and they needed a new building. The elder said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. You just keep preaching. And they showed up for the new building. Sure enough, there it was, 15 beautiful acres, wonderful sanctuary, wide halls, beautiful classroom. Sanctuary is gorgeous, stained glass windows, beautiful. But he walked in, he noticed there was only one pew and it was just at the back. And he said, there's only one pew. What, what's this? He said, well, uh, we got one pew, it's at the back. Where does everybody sit? They go to the back. And uh, so they watched, and sure enough, people came in, went to the back, sat on the pew. When it filled up, sirens um, rang and bells clang and strobe lights went off, and the pew slid all the way up to the front. <laughs> and um, another one popped up in the back. And... Um, when it filled up, it slid to the front. Another one popped up. Pastor looked at it and said to the elder, that's ingenious. I love that. And uh, the elder looked at the pastor and said, yeah, I thought you would. <laughs> Wait do you see what happens to the pulpit at 12 o'clock. <laughs> so I need y'all to hang with me, please. I don't want to know what happens at, uh, when the red light goes on, all right? Let me ask, just also greet you on behalf of Briarwood Presbyterian Church. We do love to, but we're actually, he said partnership. Actually, we're just really blessed through Ligonier. And we again, uh, it's been a while since we've done it. We're going to be hosting, as many of you know, the regional conference this August. I think it's 13th and 14th. Love to invite you. Love to invite you down to uh, Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, anytime, come and visit us at Briarwood and experience the opportunity to to be with us. We'd love to have you. And uh, two reasons. Number one, we'd just love to have you. And uh, I know you'll be blessed in the conference, the Ligonier Conference. And um, second reason is, and come to Birmingham in Alabama, when you die and go to heaven, it won't be a culture shock. So, uh, <laughs> so you'll be fine. I heard uh, Chris say early on that uh, they're always, you know, they, what, 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 <laughs> what, um, episode, what teaching event, what seminar, what session is going to get us kicked off YouTube? You heard him say that yesterday. I was sitting with my wife. I said, they gave that one to me. <laughs> and uh, so, so I want you to jump into this with me. We know the situation around us. You see the LGBTQAI plus. Do not forget the plus. That tells you it's not finished. LGBTQAI plus. A movement that is sweeping the culture. I mean, it's a tectonic movement. It's a, uh, the changes are, uh, are seismic. Uh, it's really interesting. One, um, my friend Al Mohler characterized it as, a, um, as simply a uh, tsunami wave, and its rapidity is overwhelming of what's happening and how it's changing. It has revealed the culture shapers of our progressive secular humanist age, uh, the culture shapers, big business, big government, um, media, uh, journalism, 
and, um, and the Academy. Those are the five big culture shapers of the day, and they are fully at work. And, uh, and so all of that presents certain challenges and temptations. And in these few minutes, I want to try to at least get you a couple of thoughts about it. So what are you going to do with this? Uh, the, the, um, the legal dynamics of uh, uh, the affirmation of the mythology of same-sex marriage uh, or the fabrication of same-sex marriage. Uh, you see all the stuff that's happening, the destruction of female sports, the, uh, the dangers that come in terms of the loss of privacy and modesty. Um, the uh, rising toll. We now have legislative. <laughs> never thought. I, I mean, I have uh, I have uh, dealt with the sanctity of life ever since Roe v. Wade, but I never, never thought I would see actually a proposed initiative out of a state legislature that a woman can and um, a woman can have the prerogative to take the life of the child up to 28 days after birth, infanticide being embraced. We see not passive but active euthanasia being proposed. We see um, all of those things are taking place. And I'm, you see them, you know them. Now, why are they there and how do we respond to this? And that's kind of the challenge that's given to me in this matter of ethics and sexuality and gender. But then again, you've got to ask yourself a question, how are you going to respond to this? Are you going to respond? Respond to this. There's really three choices that we've got. Uh, one is to ignore it. It's out there and it's not here. We'll be okay. Just kind of circle up the wagons. Uh, second thing, a second way is, well, you know, things kind of change. That's what progressive Christianity is constantly saying to the evangelical church. Notice it's not like the days of liberalism. And I highly commend to you uh, Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, key word, and. Liberalism is not a subset. Christian liberalism is not a subset of Christianity. It's an adverse adversary. And the same thing I think is true of progressive Christianity, which is cut from the same bolt of cloth, different theological issues, but cut from the same bolt of cloth. But both of them are motivated by cultural relevance and think the mission of the church is cultural transformation. Therefore, whenever you do that, your message will be cultural accommodation. So will you engage in accommodation? I mean, the times have changed. Shouldn't we kind of, let's step back and re take a look at marriage and sexuality and all of those issues. In other words, and let me put it the way my friend R.C. Sproul says in his book, Worldviews, ethics is isness. I mean, I'm sorry, ethics is oughtness. This is what you ought to be. M morals is isness. This is what's happening. Now, we have historically said, here's the ethic, that's to inform the morals. Now, what we're doing is, what are the morals will change the ethics to accommodate it? So, instead of sacred sex, safe sex. That's what you begin to see in society. So, will we be accommodationist? Will we be, uh, will we uh, isolate, isolationist and ignore? Will we um, accommodate? But I'll tell you what the plan is from those five culture shapers is capitulation. You're in a revolution. A cultural revolution is what's taking place all around you. Revolutions are not looking for toleration. They're not looking for accommodation. In a revolution, those who, those who are making the movement, the whole purpose is capitulation. You celebrate what you previously condemn, and you condemn what you previously celebrate. So, that, so how are you going to respond? Well, there's a couple of things, and I've got to move rapidly. I'd love to tell you <laughs> so much I'd love to talk with you about. But I know I want you to take some time to go beyond what happens here, here in the next few minutes. And as you t take the time to move forward, uh, I want to give you some resources uh, and let me give you just a couple of them to deal with this area, area of ethics and the gender, uh, genderism and uh, the sexual anarchy that is pervading our culture and all of its chaos and confusion that's taking place. I mean, it's, it's all around. In fact, let me before, well, let me go ahead and give you that. Let me go ahead and give you the resources. Um, number one is just stay connected. Oh, that sounds interesting. Stay connected to Ligonier. 
And uh, you've got all of these things. They're constantly putting out things, whether it's uh, articles in Table Talk, YouTube, or whatever. I mean, R.C.'s preaching more now than he ever did before. It's, he's everywhere. <laughs> And so, um, and they've got speakers, so that's number one. Number two, uh, uh, another friend of Ligonier, a friend of mine, Peter Jones, and his ministry, Truth Exchange. Uh, number three is the ministry uh, we are discipling, and we have the privilege to see evangelism and discipleship of those coming out of the LGBTQAI plus movement, and our number one go-to source for curriculum and advice is Harvest Ministries. We're very grateful for them, and I, I commend them to you as well. Uh, number four, uh, I'm going to the book of Genesis. One of the best scholars on the book of Genesis addressing these issues specifically uh, is a dear friend of mine, and, um, and I highly appreciate him. Yeah, he's a professor of Old Testament at Westminster, Dr. Johnny Gibson. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot find a better. So one of the reasons I'm giving you these, the, the classics, you know the classics. Go, use the classics. But uh, these, these ministries are dealing with it not only biblically as it has been, but biblically as it is morphed in this present age, in this present distress. That's why I wanted to give you a couple of um, of of resources that you could go to. But of course, my resource and your resource, and whenever we're dealing with ethics, is the Word of God. So would you go with me to the book of Genesis and your copies of God's Word? Genesis chapter 1. Turn to your Bibles, in your Bibles, or turn on your Bibles. <laughs> I can't get over it. I'm sorry. I just, just haven't arrived in the present age. I mean, reading my Bible on an iPhone's like kissing my wife through a screen door. I just, uh, <laughs> I want to read uh, a couple of texts for you. We'll look with me in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Uh, the original tohu bohu. The, the earth was without form. It was formless. It was unfilled. It was void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So where did time, space, power, energy, where did it all come from? God created then he said, the ex nihilo creation of God, everything visible, everything invisible in the heavens and in the earth. Now take your Bibles and go with me to Genesis 1. These are familiar. We started off, <laughs> my wife elbowed me and said, uh, Dr. Nichols is preaching your sermon. Uh, he took us right to the book of Genesis and rightly so. Let me just say a word. There's not another book in your Bible that is hated out of the kingdom of darkness more than the book of Genesis. And there's no section hated more than Genesis 1 through 11. And, uh, and there is no passage more important than that text. Here, all of the issues in this culture you begin to deal with. What kind of a culture do we have? Let me give it. Um, here's, my, here's my summation. You are in a culture of insanity. This is what a neo-pagan, this is the return to neo-paganism. And it always brings a culture of insanity, absurdity, immorality, lethality, and it's rooted in profitability. It is a culture of insanity, a culture of absurdity. My goodness, can you, can you believe 59 genders and counting? We, um, the mythology of same-sex marriage, the fabrications of society, listening in on a Supreme Court interview in which what is a woman well, 
that depends. Can you imagine where we are as a society? Insanity, absurdity. Now, the reason why all of this has come from sin, I have people come to my office time again, Pastor, could you help me understand why my husband, why my wife? And I say, no, I, I, I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to tell you the answer, but don't come to me and ask me to tell you that I can explain sensibly sin. Sin never makes sense. Insanity, absurdity, lethality. We're killing from the womb. We're killing the, the helpless spectrum right now, the one in the womb, the one at the end of life. We now have proposals the first 28 days. We've got abortion, infanticide, active euthanasia, other categories of genocide. What do those things have in common? Imperfect lives, unwanted lives, and inconvenient lives. We found a way to legally kill them. That is insanity, that's absurdity, lethality, and immorality. Sexual anarchy is all around us. My goodness, I, I, I pray for our youth staff and our youth pastor constantly. I can't even imagine what it means to step into that ministry today and all the challenges that come from it. So we're not going to ignore it. That option's off the table. Jesus doesn't let you ignore it. God doesn't let you ignore it. He tells his people when he brings them out of Egypt, here's what the other cultures are like. He explains it in Leviticus 18 through 20, and he says, don't let it come in among you because God knows it always wants to come in among you. Satan is always trying to find a way to intimidate, to imitate, and to infiltrate, constantly trying to do that. So you've got to be ready to deal with it, and you've got to know what God says. We've got to go to God's Word, and we've got to go to the book of Genesis. And to hear sanctity of life, sanctity of gender, sanctity of family, sanctity of marriage, sanctity of work, sanctity of rest, sanctity of the Sabbath, that you just see it just rolled out. Here are the, all the foundations. Let me ask you to go one other text of Scripture with me. Go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse um, 20, uh, 26. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, singular, in his own image in the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding, um, plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth of all the earth and every tree which, um, with seed in its fruit, you shall have them yet for your food. And to everything that creeps on the earth and everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis 2, after finishing the seven days, brings us to another text I want you to turn to. And let's now sharpen the scope of the sixth day. Look with me in Genesis chapter 2 and down to verse uh, 18. And then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But as for Adam, there was not found a helper fit or a suitable helper or a completer helper for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed it up. He closed up the, its 
its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, and now he names her, this is this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Again, the play of words, ish, isha, reflection of man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So just a couple of thoughts as we uh, dive into this. I want to give you some framing principles. Boy, this is just rudimentary. Get started right out of this book of Genesis and how you can begin to address ethically the matters of gender and sexuality, starting with God's Word, starting at this point and moving forward. Here is the mission of every church. I want to say this here. I've explained to you what's happening in the culture, at least briefly. The tendency for the church is to think, uh-oh, we've got to transform the culture. That is not the mission of the church. Well, pastor, doesn't it say that these people turned the world upside down when Paul got to Europe less than 25 years after the ascension of Jesus? Yes. But Paul's mission was not to turn the world upside down. That was a consequence. Paul's mission was to turn sinners right side up. Fulfill the great commission with evangelism and discipleship. We've got this narrow mission and we've got a comprehensive message. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. That includes Genesis. That includes ethical sanctities. That includes all of those things. And then that cuts loose Christians out of the church who have a broad mission. You're salt of the earth. You're light of the world. Your life changes. Your marriage changes. <clears throat> your family changes. The way you do business changes. The way you're a citizen changes. And that's what begins to turn it loose. Therefore, you go to passages like this in the church. And instead of having the book of Genesis disappear from the pulpit schedule, it regularly appears in the pulpit schedule. Because here, now you know where you came from, who owns you, how he has designed you, and what he has decreed for you, and what he has done to rescue you from your sin so that you might embrace him, know him, and make him known. Now here is, here, here is, let me just give you five downloads, five distilling foundational framing principles in these matters. So here's the first one. The first one is, this is a theological issue. I had a guy come up to me and he said, Pastor, can I ask you a question? Yeah, he said, now look, I know you're busy, but it's just a, it's not a theological question. And I said, well, then I'm going to move on because that means you don't have a question. Yeah. All of life is theology. All of life is theology. What is salvation? What are, what are we told? This is eternal life that you, theology, know God and his son Jesus Christ and make him known. This is a, you've got to start with God's Word. Don't start with your mind. Bring your mind to God's Word. Divine revelation. Here, God doesn't explain, God doesn't explain where he came from in Genesis 1-1. And by the way, if the book of Genesis is the most attacked book in the Bible, Genesis 1-1 is the most attacked verse other than maybe Genesis 1-16 and 17. This is, I believe, the most, because uh, that is, why are we attacking all the binaries? Why are we attacking it? Why are we attacking male, female? Why are we redefining marriage? Why do we call light darkness and darkness light? The creation is binary after binary after binary. Bi why? Because it's a testimony. There is a God who exists over, above, and in all of his creation. And the creation exists because he brought it into existence. He is the one that did that. So how does man, how does man strike back at the binary of the creator over his creation? We attack 
the, cre the binaries he has put into the creation. That's what we do. And so that's what you see in front of us. So you have now a statement. Here's where you start. Everything here originates from God. He created the heavens and the earth, everything that's in it, invisible and visible. Everything, that's where you start. He is the originator. That means he's the owner. And that means he is the definer. And that means he is the director. All things exist from him unto him, and all things exist by him. That's where you, as a Christian, begin. And therefore, whether it's sexuality or marriage or whatever it is, this is not, this is not, these things do not originate from the Supreme Court or the Senate or from big academies or wherever. You know God made it and God owns it and God defines it. God formed it in three days. God filled it in the next three days. That's what you know. Secondly, heterosexuality. Uh, heterosexuality is the divine, heterosexuality is the divine decree of God, sanctified, blessed by God, and is the only good and holy and shameless sexuality, the only natural sexuality. Heterosexuality is, originates from God, is directed by God, is defined by God, by His decree, and it stands as a sanctity of God. The Creator has made the creature in His image Male and female both bear his image and together display the fullness of that image. As it is the only holy, good, shameless, natural sexuality. Now man in his rebellion will strike out against that binary. We will not have him to be God over us. So what does man come up with? Oh, no, 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 this isn't the only. And by the way... Don't you believe in freedom? I am not kidding with this. That's exactly how it's sold. Freedom. Here's, here's your current mantra. This won't last long, but here's your current mantra. That we can do, two consenting adults can do anything they want to, right? I mean, don't we believe in freedom? You know what I say when they ask me that? I said, why two? Why consent? Why adults? And believe me, those will disappear. This was the entry point to consenting adults. You see, we actually believe in something called freedom that's defined by God. It's called ordered liberty. We're set free not to do what we want to do, but we've been set free from that to do what He wants us to do. And the reason we do it is not so He will save us. The reason we do it is because He has saved us. What we do is an act of worship. In obedience, it's an act of worship because of what He did to set us free. But man in rebellion says no, and he's invented monosexuality. Go look. Remember what I said, industries, profitable in industries of sin? I said a culture of insanity, absurdity, lethality, immorality, rooted and profitable. Do you know how tough it was for Paul at Ephesus? You know why? Because a lot of people made money off idolatry. Do you know how tough it is to bring the witness of Christ, salt and light into this culture? A lot of people are making money off monosexuality. There's a pornographic industry that is unbelievably profitable. You have no idea of the billions and billions and billions of dollars. Do you know what was being made right now off of killing the inconvenient, the unwanted, and the imperfect in the womb? Do you know how much money's made off of that? Do you know what's happening in transgenderism? This unbelievable child abuse of gender reassignment surgery 
There's another fabrication. This is nothing more than surgical mutilation and chemical castration is what is taking place. And it takes place upon children. And it has irreversible consequences. But do you want to know how much money is made out of it? There is rooted in profitability where we take children and we put drugs into young men that we use to castrate sexual predators. Here is an unbelievable dynamic that's taking place. This is a difficult, these are difficult issues to do. I understand right now you feel as uncomfortable as I do. I feel more uncomfortable than you do. I mean, I'm wearing a vest in Florida. And I know we have to speak carefully, and I know we have to speak thoughtfully, and I know we have to avoid provocative language. I'm well aware of that, but I can't be silent because the Bible's not silent. And I know the world is coming after your children, and I know the one alone who doesn't simply protect them, he redeems them and turns them loose into the world as salt and light. That's what I know. I tell our high school students after we poured everything into them, I know what's going to happen from some of your professors, and I feel sorry for them when you go into that class <laughs> because of how God is going to use you. So I can't be silent. And I know some of you are dealing with these things in your families. I know that. Do you know, what we, do you know the gender dysphoria, which I believe there is such a mental dynamic that takes place in adolescence? It used to number 3%. That's what it numbered. Somewhere between, 95, uh, from somewhere between 3 to 5% of kids and adolescents went through this issue of gender dysphoria. Of that number, 98%, it was dealt with just in the process of adolescence. And the others were given appropriate counseling not surgical mutilation. You don't reassign a gender. You just mutilate a body, put that body in the ground, dig it up a hundred years later, and it will have the DNA of what the creation, of what the Creator gave them. No gender was reassigned. Folks, these are crucial issues. They're crucial issues for multiple reasons. Well, and I've got to give you the last four in eight minutes. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. No, so let me, let me go to the, to the next one. Uh, I mean, let me just give you this. Uh, let me just give you one. Uh, let me finish these. All right. <laughs> I forgot where I was. Monosexuality is the invention of, hu of sinful man. Homosexuality is the inventual invention of, uh, of uh, sinful men. Bisexuality, the invention of sinful men transsexuality, and bestiality. By the way, Leviticus warns you against all of them. This isn't new. Wherever paganism has reigned, and now we are in a neo-paganism, the evil empire, to quote my friend Peter, Peter Jones, is striking back. Here it comes, not to, not to a, a culture, but a culture that has been liberated from paganism for almost 800 years is now willingly walking back and calling light darkness and darkness light. How great is that darkness? So here we are. We, um, I'm fully aware of the dynamics of this. I'm fully aware of the challenges of it, but the two principles thus far is a theological issue. It is a statement. We start with this. God is sovereign, sufficient, and God is reliable, and God is our life as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, and this God we know through the Word of God. Now, you can know the Word of God and not know the God of the Word, but you can't know the God of the Word without the Word of God. So we start as a theological issue. Heterosexuality, the, the text tells us, is the divine decree that God 
pronounces a benediction. It's good, it's holy, it's shameless, it is what I have created in nature. Everything else is unnatural. Everything else is unnatural. This alone is created by God as consistent with the, with the creation mandates. Number three, heterosexuality is sanctified. Heterosexuality is sanctified within the covenant of marriage alone. Heterosexuality is sanctified within the cultural, uh, within the covenant of marriage alone. What is marriage? The text tells you, one man, one woman, one life. Let me take it one more step because you, you all like words with a little bit more syllables. Here we go. Uh, uh, um, a biblical understanding of marriage, which by the way is not just for Christians, it's for the creation. We, uh, our marriage is called Christian marriage, but marriage is to be held in, uh, is to be, let the marriage bed be held in honor among all. Let it be undefiled among all. Fornicators and adulterers, any sexuality outside of marriage brings judgment and sometimes is judgment of God, as Romans 1 tells us. So here is marriage. Marriage is a conjugal, heterosexual, monogamous, covenantal relationship. It is a monogamous, heterosexual, conjugal relationship, and that's what God has given to us. Jesus was asked many times about marriage. He always went back to Genesis 2.24. For this cause, a man, and his, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Even at East Carolina University, one plus one equals one would get me an F. <laughs> but the reality is by the hand of God, that's what he has ordained. And the sovereign sufficient one is bringing, able to bring that glorious testimony to marriage. One plus one equals one. Now, if you don't leave, you got one plus one equals six, that's a problem. If you don't cleave, then you got one plus one equals two. Do you see what he's saying? He's not calling marriage a partnership. It's a man 100% committed to his wife and a wife 100% committed to her husband. We're not 50-50 negotiating. We are completely committed to one another. Number, um, that, I can't, I think that was the singles that were applauding then. Um, <laughs> premarital sex, wrong. Extramarital sex, wrong. Monosexuality, wrong. Uh, it all have consequences. That, we're starting, I've got the remedy coming but you got to understand the bad news. Did y'all hear that last night? You got to hear the bad news, this, which is actually the good news. This is what the creator created, and he said what? Good. And in this area, he said very good. Then we've got uh, the fourth thing is marital sexuality alone, alone can be and should be shameless, honorable, and good in marriage. Marital, uh, previously, heterosexuality is sanctified within marriage alone. Now, number four, marital sexuality alone. Marital sexuality alone can be uh, and should be holy, shameless, honorable, and good. There's only two genders, that's clear, male and female. Why? It takes both to fully testify to the Creator's image. Now, a man bears the image, a male bears the image, a woman bears the image of God, but together God said, I'll make, we'll make man male and female in our image. They both bear the image and then together they manifest that image in this world. Where is that designed to be worked out with clarity and the blessings of intimacy within the marriage? That's what God has given. The second reason that God gave um, male and female is because it's not good for the man to what? Be alone. Now, with all due respect, I know I may be on the edge here just a little bit. I've only got about two minutes to be on the edge, but here I go on the edge. Here's the edge. I don't think he's talking about relationships. Who met with God? Who met with Adam? I don't think he was short relationally. I think it's referring to the creation mandate. How was Adam made from the dust of the ground, right? Why? He was subdue the earth. 
He was to have dominion over the creatures of the earth. He was to multiply and fill the earth. He is made from the earth. But he can't do those three things alone. Just read the previous verses. There wasn't found a suitable helper for him. To do what? To subdue the earth, have dominion. And I'm not, I am not downplaying the relational. I am not doing that. I'm just saying I think the text is referring he can't do, he cannot fill this earth and there's not another suitable helpmate. And then God made what? Not another man. Or two men. Or three people. He made a woman. And where does he take her? Not from the dust of the ground. He takes her from the side. Why? We heard some excellent Matthew Henry quotes. I won't go back over them. But I think it's because that's where she fits in his side, that they are together. So here is why, why, and that's, and together they are able to subdue the earth. They are able to rule over the creation and have dominion. And together they are to be able to multiply and to, and, and then God's given them the intimacy of marriage. You see, God made the marriage to accomplish what he made man, male and female, to do. Did y'all hear the great discussion on the Sabbath yesterday? See, God didn't make the God didn't make man for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for man. Same thing with marriage. God didn't make marriage and then make man. He made man, male and female, and then what? made marriage. Where do you have marriage? Where do you have man, for, man first, male and female? Then comes the marriage and God performs it and he pulls them together in and through the Lord. And what is sexuality? Now follow this. Sexuality, heterosexuality initiates the marriage. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. That's what I say at the end of a wedding. Uh, I say at the end of a wedding, I say, um, upon the consummation of this union, I pronounce you man and wife. And so what the, 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 the heterosexual intimate relationship initiates the marriage. Read 1 Corinthians 7. You recreate with one another in celebration in the marriage, and then you procreate. It initiates, recreates, and procreates within the context of marriage. Fifthly and finally, the answer to this problem in our culture is the gospel. It is the double cure. It cures, it cures us from sin's power and sin's shame. Man, I, I read and minister sexual rebellion against God and how you can't even look at each other, the person you used, how sometimes you'll find sitting in a shower just trying to wash away the shame and the guilt. It, it's cringe. It cringes you. Crawling up in a bed and pulling the covers over and wanting to be covered up. That's an instinct. Just like the instinct they went and found leaves and tried to cover themselves up. But 1 Corinthians 6 says, and such were some of you. But you've been washed. You've been clothed. You've got a robe of righteousness that's put around you. And your sins are taken away and it's shame and it's guilt and you're right before God. But that's not all. Not only has the penalty been removed, but the power of sin has been broken. You've been born again. You've got a new heart. You've got a new record. You've got a new life. You've got a new family. You've got a new home. And now God, with his word, by his spirit, is giving you a new mind so that you might live unto him, for him, and through him. I just love to tell him. We have some folks out of the LGBTQ, and I just love to tell them, God did much to save you. But he didn't do much to save you to make much of you. He did much to save you to set you free, and now you can know the joy of making much of him. It's unbelievable the joy that comes. Jesus became for you what he had never been, the Son of Man, without ceasing to be the Son of God, to make you 
what you could never be. Now, let's follow his paths in his word to the praise of his glorious grace. Father, thank you for the moment and the privilege to be with my brothers and sisters. Would you please just take these uh, beginning thoughts, send them to many others whom you will use, but send them back to your word so that your word goes in them. And we're not going to isolate. We're in the world, but we are not going to accommodate. We're not of the world. We are going to bring as ambassadors the kingdom of God to those trapped in sin with the glorious message that Jesus cancels the power of sin. He not only cancels the penalty, he cancels the power. He breaks the power of that canceled sin. Help us preach it, help people embrace it, and then change them in life for your glory and then unleash your church once again from the, from the church where we are discipled and grow and worship and evangelize into the world, salt and light. And may Jesus reign. This is our Father's world. Amen. We need a message from Dr. Harry Reader as we seek to shine his lights in the world for the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us live online. You, We're taking a very quick break here in Orlando, but don't go far. At about 9.55 Eastern Time, Dr. W. Robert Godfrey will deliver our next message. Before the break, I want to remind you about three free e-books you can download today, written by Ligonier's founder, Dr. R.C. Sproul. They bring clear biblical answers to some of the important ethical questions that people have faced today. The titles are, What is the Relationship Between Church and State? How Can I Develop a Christian Conscience? And How Should I Think? These e-books are our free gift to you, and you can download them by visiting ligonier.org slash ethics. Stick around, and we'll be back with Dr. W. Robert Godfrey at 9.55 Eastern Time. Oh, so, so. 
Welcome back, I'm Nathan W. Bingham and I hope you're enjoying Ligonier's National Conference so far. We love to hear about the insights you're gaining, the moments you've most appreciated, and the quotes that have really stood out to you. Share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag LIGCON, that's L-I-G-C-O-N. And remember, share the live stream with your friends. We've looked at some weighty subjects already this morning and we're about to consider some more. Our next speaker is Dr. W. Robert Godfrey with a message on statism and socialism. Now here's Chris Larson to introduce Dr. Godfrey. It is so uh, strategically important. Taking us uh, to our next subject this morning will be Dr. Godfrey. Dr. Godfrey, of course, is known to many of you who've been with us at Ligonier Conferences for many years. Um, many of you have enjoyed his overview series of church history, that teaching series, 73 parts. It really is, I think, the best uh, first step to introduce somebody into the scope of the history of the Christian church. And so I would encourage you to check out that resource. It is so encouraging and rooting for us as God's people. Many of you would know, though, that he also served as president at Westminster Seminary, California, and where he was also a professor of church history for some time, which isn't to say that he's old at all. This is my time, Bob. <laughs> you get yours in just a moment. <laughs> He's probably going to chastise me because this is not the first time we've asked him to address statism, that riveting title for a subject. <laughs> so we're looking forward to having him tease me some more. Uh, the reality is, is that Dr. Godfrey has thrown himself into the work of Ligonier Ministries, now as the chairman of our board. Dr. Sproul handpicked him uh, to succeed him in that, and he has been an encourager, a cheerleader for our work. Uh, I depend on him so often for counsel and guidance, and he has been really just what the Lord has uh, blessed us with over the past few years in ways that we couldn't have even anticipated in its planning. And we're so glad that he can be with us and that he continues his fruitful teaching ministry through Ligonier. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Godfrey. Well, I am delighted to be here, uh, delighted to have the opportunity to pick on Chris Larson. Um, when I first got to know Chris, I was six foot three, and he has pounded me into the ground. Um, Chris maintains it's really not his fault that I get these hopeless titles foisted upon me. Um, last year, I had to give the sex talk, <laughs> and I explained to you then why I thought that was the case. Um, Harry wasn't here, so I suggest it was because I was the hottest teaching fellow. But clearly, I didn't get it right, so they got Harry here this year to do it right, <laughs> and I'm glad for that. To quote R.C. Sproul, what is the matter with you people? <laughs> Have you really not got something better to do than listen to a lecture on statism and socialism? <laughs> you know what we need in America? More talk about politics. So I thought I might just cut to the chase and tell you who you should vote for in November. <laughs> well, if I did that, it would be wrong, wouldn't it? I have opinions about who you should vote for in November. But as a minister of the Word of God, 
the Word of God does not tell me who to vote for in November. The Word of God gives me all sorts of principles to apply to the question, for whom should I vote in November? But when I look in my concordance, I can't find Biden or Trump. <laughs> Although there is the last Trump, so, um, but that's another whole. <laughs> what do we as Christians need to think about the state and about government in our time? Because one of the things that has concerned me is how very polarized we have become. And uh, when you're a historian, you know to be suspicious about those who tell you this is the worst of all possible times in which to live. That's usually not true. I mean, someone has to live in the worst of times, but I think uh, usually we don't know enough about history to know when the worst of times were. And surely when we see the deplorable pictures of what's happening in the Ukraine, we know we are not living in the worst of times or situations. But perhaps because of the social media and television and the other ways of communication in our time, it's a lot easier to get outraged than it used to be. And. I think as Christians, there are surely things about which to be outraged, but we as a people ought not to be characterized by outrage. We ought to be seen as the people who know how to listen, who know how to love, who know how to be concerned, who know how to communicate. Now, there are times for righteous anger. There are times for disagreement. But I think we all need to have a clear and settled foundation of what the Bible directs us as Christians to think about the state. The Bible does not tell us everything about the state but it surely tells us the most important things. It tells us the necessary things. It directs us in our thinking about the state. And it challenges us. So, this morning, I want to think about the state under three points. And the first is that the state is a divine institution. However much we may get annoyed at government, whether local or state or federal, we have to always have clearly in mind that the state is a divine institution. Think of these words from 1 Peter chapter 2. Have you read through 1 Peter recently? I taught 1 Peter in our Sunday school at our church a couple of years ago and discovered that uh, 1 Peter is a really annoying book. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to Peter. He tells wives to be obedient to their husbands. We don't want to hear that. He tells slaves to be obedient to their masters. We don't want to hear that. He tells citizens to honor their government. We don't want to hear that. But I'm going to read from 1 Peter anyway, and you're going to have to listen. 1 <laughs> Peter chapter 2, verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, 
not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Uh, Peter is encouraging the Christians to whom he writes to think carefully about the state as a divine institution, because if we read between the lines here, it would appear that some Christians were saying, I am free in Christ. I am delivered in Christ. I'm a citizen of a new kingdom. I'm looking forward to a new heaven and earth in which righteousness dwells, and that means I don't have to pay attention to this government on earth anymore. I'm free. And Peter says, you are free in Christ, but that freedom does not give you the right to despise or disparage the government God has set over you on earth. There is a new heaven and a new earth coming, but it hasn't come yet. And even though your first allegiance is to Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords, that doesn't dissolve your responsibility to be subject to the emperor. Uh, Peter is very concerned that Christians think clearly and accurately about the state. Because God has instituted the state. He instituted it not like marriage. God instituted marriage before the fall. But after the fall, God instituted the state to restrain evil in a fallen world. The government's calling, the government's task is to punish evil and promote the good. And however little we think the government accurately and successfully does that, that's the calling laid upon the government by God, a calling that we have to honor, Peter says. And that's interesting, isn't it? Honor the emperor. It's not just a grudging obedience to which we're called, but we have to recognize in the ruling authorities, in the governing authorities, the work of God, the purpose of God, the calling of God. And that leads me to repent of some of the things I've said about some of our governors, even though they were probably correct. Whether we agree with them or not, they serve a purpose, a vital purpose, a critical purpose. Luther said, the worst government imaginable is better than chaos. And I think that's true. When you look again at those awful pictures coming in from Ukraine, of utterly bombed out cities, no food, no water, no power. What would it be like to live in that chaos? It's so painful, it's so unimaginable that I think we, we rather quickly just don't want to see those pictures anymore. It was Joseph Stalin who said, One death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. And uh, I don't think I agree with Joe Stalin about much. But it's sort of true. We can't process the notion of a million tragedies, what that is actually like. The poor Ukraine. Maybe the country in the world that in the last hundred years has suffered more than any other country. Stalin killed millions there in the 20s and early 30s. Hitler killed millions of more in the later 30s and 40s. And now they suffer again. 
The worst government that brings some peace is better than that. We need to honor a government because God has established the government to restrain evil. And, and Paul, in terms very parallel to Peter in, in Romans 13, doesn't he, reminds us that we can think of the government as deacons. We probably don't do that very often. Maybe we don't think about deacons at all. But uh, government officials, Paul says, are to be thought of as deacons and also as liturgoi, worship leaders. They have a divine mission that's been given to them, and they need to be honored for that. And that needs to be the first thing that we think about when we think about the state. And that challenges me. I think you're a, you're a better people but I think Christians have perhaps gotten into habits where we don't honor the government the way we should. Now, the state is also a human institution. It's a divine institution, but it's a human institution. And that means we as humans have responsibility for it. God has given us that responsibility. And the state in history has taken many different forms, hasn't it? We've had monarchies, we've had oligarchies, we've had dictatorships, we've had republics, we've had democracies. There's a whole range of forms that the state can take by human choice. And part of the good news is Christians have lived under every form of government and served Jesus Christ in their hearts. The advancement of the kingdom of Christ cannot be stopped by the kingdoms of this world, whatever form they take. And that needs to be a great encouragement to us as Christians. And in every human form of government, the basic duty of government remains to do justice and particularly to protect the weak. You know, one of the things that outrages me and amazes me is the endless repetition after bad news is reported on television that we know people are basically good. (laughs) Well, maybe not Vladimir Putin. But you know, everybody else is basically good. Well, maybe not those Russian oligarchs that have taken money and bought billion dollar yachts. If any of you have a billion dollar yacht. I'm looking for a ride. (laughs) What would it be like to have a billion dollar yacht? You know, it just sort of boggles the mind. There's a government obligation to protect the weak because the rich and powerful can protect themselves most of the time. Uh, Government is given to restrain evil and to promote the good. But of course, as a human institution, the state can become corrupt. I don't want to shock you. (laughs) And the Psalms speak very pointedly and eloquently about that danger of corruption in human government. Psalm 94 talks about wicked rulers who frame injustice by statute. What an awful thing that those who are given responsibility and power would use that power to pass laws to entrench injustice. We should be outraged about that. And Psalm 94 says God is outraged about that, and God will come to judge that injustice. And part of the testimony we should bear as Christians 
to governing authorities is to remind them that there is a great day of judgment coming, and they should factor that in to the laws they pass. Psalm 94 condemns wicked rulers who condemn the innocent to death. It's a reality of human existence that governments have persecuted the innocent in pursuit of their gratification. Psalm 82 is another powerful psalm that speaks of that call to powerful governing figures to govern faithfully. Psalm 82 warns judges not to be unjust or show partiality to the wicked. What a strong statement that is. Do not show partiality to the wicked. Psalm 82 calls governments to give justice to the weak and fatherless, to maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute. We have to let those words grip us. Weak and who can come here are not the weak and the afflicted and the destitute. But we as Christians are called to have compassion on such people. Psalm 82 instructs rulers to rescue the weak and the needy and to deliver them from the hands of the wicked. Does that motive function in our lives as we think about the responsibility of government? That the Bible calls us as political people to have compassion and to care about the whole community. And I think we have to be very serious about that and let God's Word challenge us. Now, that doesn't mean that practical political decisions necessarily become easy. Once we are concerned and compassionate and pursuing justice and pursuing the protection of the weak. One of the huge problems in California right now is homelessness. Many parts of California, the streets are just full of homeless people. And we're told that many, most of these homeless people are either drug addicted or mentally ill. These people are clearly weak. But what should be done about it? What is the compassionate thing to do for the homeless? I'm not sure it's immediately obvious. We could have a really good discussion about how to help the homeless that would really help, that would solve the problem. And I suspect there are a variety of opinions here, uh, some of which are, are good and agree with me, and others are wrong. But when we look at the homeless, we should not just be angry, we should be compassionate and ask, is there a way to help? And as I say, we may have very legitimate differences among us as to what's the way to help, but we as Christians ought to be a people of compassion and recognize that too often our governments have been corrupted not to try to help the weak, but to help themselves. And we should be outraged about that. One of my favorite statements in the Psalms relative to this subject is in Psalm 146. You would all know this if you sang Psalms. Um, Chris Larson would be disappointed if I didn't say that. Um, (laughs) Psalm 146 says, put not your trust in princes. Put not 
your trust in princes. Why should you not put your trust in princes? Well, partly because they're sinners. But the psalmist takes a very hard, realistic look at life and says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Nothing in this life is dependable because death comes for us all. That's what the psalm is saying. So if you have your favorite politician, that can be a good thing. But don't put your ultimate trust in that politician. Because death comes, and in that moment his plans fail. It's interesting to see that in the recent history of the Supreme Court of the United States. Antonin Scalia dies suddenly. Conservatives are distraught. Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies a little surprisingly, and liberals are distraught. And we have to say, put not your trust in princes. What does the center of Psalm 146 say, the heart of it? Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Who is the king who keeps faith forever? Who is the ruler who does not die and see his plans come to nothing? It's the Lord our God. It's the Lord our God. And it's in him we have to trust. So the state is a human, inst- uh, a divine institution that we must honor. It's a human institution that we should seek to influence in proper directions, but so- despite its sinfulness. But it can become, the Scripture says, a demonic institution. And that's probably what this title of statism was intended to get us to. But I thought we shouldn't just start there. We should get oriented before we get there. But the state can become a demonic institution when the state claims for itself all power all meaning, all direction of life. One of the great ancient examples of that was ancient Egypt. And so it's not so surprising that uh, the great story of the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt is a confrontation between the true and living God and Pharaoh who claimed to be God. Pharaoh who, in his leadership of the state, was both king and priest and God. And therefore, all honor and obedience had to be given to Pharaoh. That is statism in its ultimate form. The state that claims to give all meaning and claims to have all power is a state that has become demonic. And we have seen that at various times in the history of mankind. We saw that in the Third Reich, didn't we? When Adolf Hitler claimed he could build a kingdom that would last a thousand years, and in which the state claimed all authority and all meaning. We saw it in the Soviet Union when the Communist Party claimed to have all power and all meaning and to direct all living. And this kind of demonizing of the state always happens 
in places where the true and living God is neglected and rejected. And the great picture of that in Scripture is the great prostitute of Revelation 17, which is in some ways a picture of the Roman Empire, but is much more than that as a representation of a state that claims the worship of its citizens. Revelation 17 talks about the great prostitute as sitting on the back of the scarlet beast, that is Satan. So, the state is serving Satan in that picture. And the kings of the earth are described as committing immorality with this great prostitute, which is meant metaphorically to talk about idolatry. It's spiritual adultery that's in mind here. And this prostitute is adorned richly in expensive cloth and in valuable jewels to talk about her wealth and domineering position. And in her madness, she's described as drunk, drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And this prostitute and those who serve her, Revelation 17, 14 says, will make war on the Lamb. What a contrast between the beast ridden by this great prostitute and all this claim of wealth and power and the Lamb. The Lamb looking as it was slain, the apparent powerlessness of the Lamb in the face of the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He, the Lamb, is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. They're talking about you. Are you with the Lamb? Have you heard His call? Do you know that you're chosen? You know, election in the Bible is never a doctrine that brings uncertainty or confusion or misery or mystery. Election in the Bible always brings encouragement and certainty and stability. Are you with the Lamb? Are you called? Are you chosen? Are you faithful? Called and chosen are the two parts God does. Are you faithful? Do you know the number one sin in Revelation 21 that is disqualifying from entering the heavenly city? The number one sin is cowardice. Those who haven't been faithful to stand with the Lamb in the battle. Are you faithful? Because the Lamb is winning. The Lamb is winning. And however demonic the state becomes, that state will be defeated. Pharaoh ruled in Egypt maybe as much as 2,500 years. That's a long time. That's older than Harry Reader. <laughs> older than Bob Godfrey. 2,500 years. 
Where's Pharaoh today? Where's Hitler today? Where is Stalin today? You know what the first word in the book of the Revelation about Babylon, that great prostitute, is? The first word, Revelation 14, 8. Don't forget this first word. The first word in the Bible, in the book of the Revelation, about Babylon is fallen. Fallen is Babylon the great. Those forces that rise up against God will not stand, however powerful they seem to be in the moment. The demonic state will not stand. Now, in the eight minutes remaining, we can talk about socialism. (laughs) Socialism is a word that has many different meanings. When I was growing up in America, if you did not like your political opponent, you called him a socialist. And that meant the end of him. If you got the socialist label to stick in America, that was the political end of somebody. Socialism is a word that can mean many different things in different circumstances and to different people. R.C. Sproul would have said to us, you know, some words are equivocal and others are equivocal. Some words always have a single meaning. Other words have multiple meanings. So socialism can sort of mean different things. What socialism originally meant in the 19th century when it arose was a philosophy that said the state should own and operate the basic means of production for the good of everybody. Now, there were those who supported socialism and said, see how they care for the poor. Isn't that a good thing? And there were critics of socialism who said, if the state owns everything, it means it's stolen what it owns from the people who originally owned it, and it's nothing but thievery. And other people stood back and said socialism in action usually leads to everybody being poor. So socialism is a little bit difficult to talk about in eight minutes. (laughs) What we need to know about the history of socialism is that it was usually driven in its origins by a fundamentally godless outlook. We live only in this world. We need to get as much of the good of this world as we can because this is the only world we have. It's part of the shift in the 19th century in the West uh, from a culture that thought about heaven as well as earth to a culture that increasingly thought only about earth. Governments ought to think, we've already said this, haven't we? Governments ought to think about how they can help the weak and the poor. But governments should not pursue that responsibility by saying they own everything. And Christians have stood against that kind of socialism that has not worked either theoretically or practically. One sometimes wishes that pragmatists in this world would be more pragmatic. So, how should we as Christians think about the various dimensions of the state? How should we relate to this reality? Most of us are not going to Washington to serve in the Congress or the Senate or the White House. If if one of you wants to do that, let me know. I'll vote for you. (laughs) 
Did you uh, watch Bob Dole's funeral? He left a letter to the country and said in that letter that he was looking forward to having a number of his questions asked, answered in heaven. And one of the questions he wanted answered in heaven was, would he still be able to vote in Chicago? (laughs) I'm not taking sides, I'm just (laughs) trying to get a laugh. How should we as Christians think about these things? As Christians, it seems to me we ought to think this way. This world is important, and we ought to seek to be as faithful, as justice-promoting, as loving in this world as we can be. And we ought to use what influence we have that our government would reflect real justice and real love. But while we believe that sincerely, while we should work for that earnestly, we have to even form more fundamentally remind ourselves, as Hebrews 13 tells us, we have here no continuing city. We have a city here, wherever we're from. We have a city. We should be concerned about the city. But when we are concerned about the city that we have here and now, we need to remember that city will not continue. It's not our ultimate concern. It's not the ultimate value. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My purpose is not to challenge Pilate to be governor of Judea. My purpose is to call people into a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that will endure forever, that will be a kingdom in which finally, 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 there will be righteousness through and through. Abraham Kuyper, the great Dutch Reformed theologian and and politician, said, the great sin of Western civilization, as he looked at it in the late 19th, early 20th century, is the sin of materialism thinking that what really matters is what we possess. And we need to always remember what really matters is what we hope for, what's coming, the new heaven and the new earth. Read Psalm 87. Maybe even sing it. Psalm 87 says, everyone, everyone, everyone who knows the Lord God is born again in Zion. That's our city. That's the city that will continue. That's the city in which righteousness will dwell. That's the city in which we will all love one another as we ought to be loved. And until then, until the revelation of that city. Let's try to be less outraged and more loving, and in that way, be a light to the world. Thank you. You just heard Dr. W. Robert Godfrey here at Ligonier's National Conference. I'm grateful for the wisdom that Dr. Godfrey brings to our cultural moment, drawing from both scripture and church history. We have a special offer to help you continue studying God's Word with our chairman. For your donation of any amount, we'll send you Dr. Godfrey's video teaching series, Learning to Love the Psalms, which you'll be able to stream in the Ligonier app while you wait for the DVD to arrive. 
his hardcover book with the same title and the digital study guide. To receive this special offer, available only during the conference, visit ligonier.org slash psalms. Thank you for your generous support. You make live streams like this one possible as we seek to serve growing Christians around the world. As we head into a break, you can find even more teaching and discipleship resources in our online conference bookstore at significantly discounted rates. Browse the collection now at ligonier.org slash bookstore. I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I'll see you back here for our next session at 11.35 Eastern Time.
I'm joined by Dr. Harry Reeder, the Senior Minister of Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Dr. Reeder, this weekend we are talking about uh, ethics and Christian ethics and we've, we've asked you to talk about the issue of gender. Now, there is so much confusion out there in the world and one of the things that's challenging, it's not just that the world has different views on gender, they're actually trying to push that onto the church and influence Christian thinking. Why is it so important that we understand gender rightly and biblically? Well, can I, can I back up on the question just a little bit? Absolutely. Why is it so important to address this, as you have outlined in the conference, from a biblical ethic? Uh, in other words, how do we form our understanding of behavior and uh, from an ethical perspective? Can I migrate to RC for a minute? Please do. Um, in one of the classes early on when I've had the privilege to have RC and as a mentor throughout the years, is he, he wonderfully helped us understand the difference between ethics and morals. Morals is what you are doing in response to what you, uh, in response to challenges in a culture. This is the morality, this is your isness. Uh, ethics is oughtness. Mm. Now the question for the Christian is where's our oughtness when it comes to gender and sexuality, which is the topic assigned to me. And that's the great challenge. Will the church hold the line and say, ma uh, the issue of magisterium, what is our final rule and authority? It's got to be the scriptures, not the culture. Uh, I, you know, back in the Reformation, the great challenge was ecclesiastical magisterium, the church speaking, or biblical magisterium, sola scriptura. Well, today the challenge is cultural magisterium, or is it going to be biblical magisterium? What does God say? That then brings us to his word. That then brings us to Genesis. The, as I say in my talk, uh, that that particular book is the most contended and assaulted uh, from the outside and even within uh, Christian lib uh, liberalism and progressivism. It is assaulted because it is there the sanctity of life, sanctity of marriage, sanctity of gender, sanctity of sexuality, sanctity of family, sanctity of divine revelation. It's there the stakes are put in the ground. What do you say to someone that says, you know, the Bible's not a science book. So we know more about gender today than Moses or the Apostle Paul. Well, certainly we know more about gender and ev everything we know affirms what the Bible says. Science is not the enemy of the Bible. It's uh, like archeology. span It is something, the Bible is God's word given to us in a historical setting. It's like I say to people, uh, uh, you know, when you do the Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, uh, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. That's history. That's not doctrine. That's history. Doctrine is what that means that's recorded in God's Word. So when God's Word speaks, we believe it's truth. Then we go into the disciplines of life, sociology, science, or as one of the reformers say, after you climb all the disciplines of education, you shake hands with the theologians at the top of the mountain because God's word is always true. Now what's being challenged in liberalism, what was challenged was the inerrancy of that word. What's being challenged today is the sufficiency of that word. Is it sufficient to deal with the claims from the culture concerning gender, concerning sexuality? And I believe it is sufficient. In fact, every time we deal with it, the Bible stands clearly accurate, um, like when you do things such like gender reassignment surgery. That's a fabrication. You, have an you, have a, you may have mutilated a body, but you have not reassigned the gender. When that person goes in the ground and the DNA's dug up, it'll be the gender that God created. And there's two of them, male and female. That's what God has established and revealed in this word to properly image him uh, in this world. It seems that perhaps we haven't lived in a time where it is so easy to break the seventh commandment in our hearts, lust, uh, with the prevalence of pornography. Um, what counsel would you give to parents that are trying to better help and equip their, their children that are uh, so easily exposed to a dark world that's just one click away 
oftentimes? Wow, that is a gigantic question. Uh, I mean, and, and really, I think a very profound question. Number one, the parents have got to own their responsibility to evangelize and disciple their children in the context of Christ Church. Uh, you've got to and use all the gifts in the body to help you, but you've got to own it as a parent. Your child doesn't need just to learn the right thing to do. They need to know Jesus. You've got to evangelize them. Otherwise, you're just raising a Pharisee. But when you're raising them and you're teaching them, here's what it means to know Christ. Here is how you make Christ known in life, that not only do you mentor them, you teach them, but you model it for them so that children know my dad's going to come home tonight. Children know, uh, children know that when I get up in the morning, dad's going to be there. Uh, they know that their mom is going to be faithful. They know that because they see the relationship that's there. And even in the challenges of marriage, which all marriages have challenge, there is an intentional reliance upon God's grace to follow God's word. And our devotion to Christ is going to be manifested first in our marriage, and then it'll be seen by our children as we raise them. Number three is realize the culture doesn't stay outside of your home and it doesn't stay outside of the church. We have to teach. The church is not only built on the truth, the church is built to uphold the truth. It is to be a pillar and support of the truth. Therefore, in the context of the church, you are getting equipped. You are getting equipped to show your children the Word of God. And that's what, and, and the power of the Word of God, and the sufficiency of God's Word, and you're willing to take on all the issues where they are in their life. Five-year-olds hear one thing. Five-year-old, you start there. Ten-year-olds, you go to another place. Fifteen years old, you go to another place. And so while we never want to be careless in speaking about sexuality and gender, we don't want to be silent because God's not silent, and he knows the culture is always going to try to come in. That's why Leviticus 18 through 20 was written. One final question for you. What, what word of exhortation would you give to someone that is perhaps struggling with gender identity? They're confused with everything they're hearing out there in the world. What gospel hope do they have? Well, you got every hope in the gospel. Uh, number one, remember, uh, number one, remember that God made you male, God made you female, and both are required. Now, male bears the image of God, female bears the image of God, but the male and the female in, in, uh, in a complementary relationship is brings the fullness of the testimony of the image of God into the world. So there's something about being a man, there's something about being a woman. Now, the culture has all kind of clues, but don't go to the culture, go to the scriptures. When the Bible says uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, act like men, well, that automatically tells you what? There's something called manliness which means there's something called womanliness. There's both of those. There's biblical masculinity, there's biblical femininity. Now what does the Bible say that that is? Not what does the culture say that that is? I got two daughters and they were never going to be a cheerleader. Uh, they became scholarship athletes. They were competitive, but they acted like women in the field of competition. There, they had all of those marks that the Bible lays out for a woman of God, and I got a son, tried to teach him, this is what a man of God is. These are the marks of manhood, strength and courage to embrace your responsibilities, sensitivity and compassion. That's where we even get the term in our culture, gentle men. And then you take both men and women and you point them to Christ, who is standing in heaven, the Lion of Judah, uh, slain like a lamb. So lion-hearted and lamb-like is the character dynamic of men and women of God as they express it through the way God made us in creation. He made us different. We are different. It's not superior or inferior. It's different. And then give your kids good models from the Bible and history of, of, um, of manhood and womanhood, but always point them ultimately to Christ because all of our models have feet of clay, but it's Christ they want to look to. Yet Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Give your kids some godly men and women as models and mentors out of the church, out of history, and then be a model and a mentor in the life of your child. 
Well, Dr. Rita, we're grateful you're here this weekend, and I'm thankful for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Nathan. Many of us feel overwhelmed. We can start to believe what the world has been telling us for years. To believe the Bible is a leap of faith. To say that Jesus Christ is the only way to know God is arrogant. The temptation is to retreat and take our gospel hope with us. It's time for us to recapture that vision, to take back lost ground. It's time to renew our minds. Peace.
I'm joined by the senior minister of the First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. He's also a Ligonier Ministries teaching fellow, Dr. Derek Thomas. Dr. Thomas, this weekend, as we're considering the, the topic of Christian ethics, you're going to be addressing uh, the sin of partiality. So I want to begin by asking, what do we mean by the sin of partiality? Well, these topics are chosen for us. Uh, I want to make that clear. Uh, it, it's James chapter 2. Uh, there are lots of passages about partiality, but God shows no partiality. Uh, that God doesn't differentiate between one group of people and another, one race and another, one gender and another. Uh, so James, and I, I kind of wonder if James uh, would walk into church in Jerusalem. And, and he was, I mean, he was top dog in terms of the apostles in Jerusalem. Uh, and I think he noticed that people gave him deference, uh, didn't speak to him in the same manner and tone as they spoke to other people. And that's because James, along with Jude, uh, was Jesus' brother. And as Protestants, we, we believe that that is literally true, not, not just a cousin, but, but uh, so there was Mary and Joseph and James and Jude and, and the Bible talks about sisters in the plural, so it was a family of seven. But imagine, imagine going to church uh, on the Sabbath and, and bumping into James and all the questions that you would have about Jesus. Um, and perhaps you had never met Jesus, but this guy grew up with him, slept in the same room, played with him when he was a little boy, watched him in his teenage years, saw him grow into manhood and adulthood. And, and we know that in Galatians chapter 2, when uh, an issue arises uh, up in the church in Antioch, and it's not Peter's finest, finest moment, uh, Paul, reflecting back on that incident, talks about the men of James. So, again, giving an indication that James had some power, authority, uh, and I imagine people gave him deference all the time. And I think that's, uh, that's why James speaks uh, so much about it in chapter 2 and with such passion. Uh, that that some Christians were being treated with greater respect, uh, 
given greater deference, they were being shown partiality uh, than, than others. Now, of course, this is a very important issue for our time uh, in terms of the church's attitude towards race or towards gender or towards education. You know, we all have Christians that we like and Christians, frankly, that we don't like. I mean, let's be honest about it. There are we get along, right? <laughs> We do because, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> because you're Australian and I'm British. Um, but I mean, there's always there's always one guy or or a group of people in any church that are difficult, and so implementing this um, this ethic for James was absolutely crucial. Now, I think one of the reasons why it upset James so much was not just the personal nature in which I think he had experienced it, but showing partiality to one group over another is totally contrary to the gospel because the gospel flattens us all, no matter who you are, no matter what education, no matter what race, what country you come from, uh, the skin color, whatever, male, female, we're all sinners. And so the only reason that any of us are saved, whether we're poor, as most of the church in Jerusalem, I think, were, I think it was a relatively poor economically church, um, all of us are brought down to the lowest bar in terms of sin and depravity. And, and the only reason why anyone is saved is grace, that we are justified uh, by faith alone, uh, apart from the works of the law. But for James, James wants to stress the other side of that, that though we are justified apart from the works of the law, those who are justified will demonstrate and live out the works of the law. And uh, that's, so this issue of partiality is one of several w ways in which James wants to make sure that Christians demonstrate what what gospel grace actually looks like. Now, doesn't Scripture also call us to show honor where honor is due? Yes, I mean, I, I preach in a church where the governor is there in attendance every Sunday morning. Uh, we don't stand, but I, I, I would certainly pray for him by name, whereas I don't pray for everybody else in the church by name. Uh, I think if the Queen were to enter uh, in, in a British context, uh, we, uh, the congregation would certainly stand. Uh, so uh, we are to give honor to our parents and uh, those in authority. So, uh, but, but the sin of partiality was, I think, being expressed in inappropriate ways and being ex expressed simply on the level of the fact that they had more money. Now, every pastor wants to see a rich guy in his church because that would deal with the issue of the budget. And it's, it, it's very easy to slip into the mentality, I'll give, I'll give this person who gives boatloads of money to the church way more attention than this person who can only contribute the widow's mite. Well, we're looking forward to your session, uh, Dr. Thomas, and uh, grateful for your time today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
afternoon, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and you're with us live at Ligonier's 2022 National Conference. I'd like to remind you that if you've missed any of our conference sessions, or you'd like to watch a message again, we're making them all available in the free Ligonier app. Just search for Ligonier in your app store to download and keep checking the app as we continue to add new messages from the conference. This year's National Conference has had us thinking about Christian ethics and our responsibility to uphold God's Word in a world that is opposed to His truth. To help us, we cross now to Dr. Michael Reeves for a message titled, Standing Firm in the Truth. Well, friends, what do you think? What do you think the Apostle Paul would make of our situation today? With the culture around us growing ever more overtly hostile to biblical Christianity, what would he make of all we've been thinking through? What would he make of the situation of the church? Would he be surprised? What would he say? Would you turn with me to Philippians 1, where we see Paul not comfortable, not lionized, not accepted by Roman culture, but in chains. And there, imprisoned for his faith, he writes to the Philippians and he tells them that his ultimate concern is not what happens to him, for he doesn't know his fate. His concern is what will happen to the gospel. And from that concern erupts a passionate apostolic plea. Philippians 1, verse 27, here is what Paul would say to a church surrounded by a hostile culture and tempted to compromise. Philippians 1, 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Those are words that have echoed down the centuries, fulfilled in those times of martyrdom and persecution, when things at the time looked bleakest, but which we now know as the church's days of glory. Like the days of the reformers, Latimer and Ridley tied to a stake in Broad Street, Oxford in England, slowly burned to death for their steely insistence on the complete sufficiency of Christ as a Savior. Picture it. The situation looked so grim, so bleak. Here were the greatest preachers in England being snuffed out. 
It looked like the faith of the gospel was being smothered, choked as they choked. And yet, Latimer seemed to glimpse for a moment the angel's perspective when he turned through the flames and said to his friend, be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. For we shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as shall never be put out. Now, that answers Paul's plea, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Can you imagine it in Broad Street, Oxford? How the angels must have cheered. For there, just as the Lord appeared in the burning bush to Moses, there in the flames of martyrdom was Christ-likeness, glory in the flames. And oh, friends, to see such bright steadfastness today, oh, to see that. Today, we are heading into testing times, but let us not call them dark times. These days to come could be days of glory that will be remembered in the annals of church history when Christians, tempted to surrender, pressured, reviled, hounded, stood firm. They were of good cheer, and by their resilient faith, the annals of church history may say, they lit a candle that lighted centuries to come. But, friends, if these days to come are to be days of glory, we need to know how can we have the strength to stand firm, to endure? Where did Latimer and Ridley get such bold resilience? It's one thing for us to admire their courage, but if it were asked of us, where does it come from? And if the Philippians were wondering that question, how they could stand firm without being frightened of anything, how do you do that? Paul had actually given them the answer already in verse 20. He wrote, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Quite simply, for Paul, Christ meant more to him than life. And that's what I want to press into with you now, to prepare us, to give us backbone for our faith. But first, let me put it the other way around. What is it that makes for cowardice? What makes someone prone to compromise God's Word? And to see the answer to that, I want to look with you at the men who are probably the archetypical cowards in the Bible. Do you know who they were? The Pharisees. That surprises some because the Pharisees, they appear supremely confident and impressive. People respected and feared them. But it is striking how timid the Pharisees actually appear in the Gospels. 
You look at them, commonly, despite all their bravado in public, they commonly act only by stealth, under the cover of darkness. So remember Nicodemus in John 3 comes to Jesus at night. When is it they seek to arrest Jesus? Under the cover of darkness, when all is quiet. Or when Jesus publicly confronts them and challenges them, they remain silent. Or they grumble, whisper, conspire. Theirs was a creeping, whispery, cowardly culture. Now, why? Why were the Pharisees so frightened? Well, in John 12, Jesus cut through to the very heart of what motivated the Pharisees and tells us why. This is why they were so timid. This is why those who should stand firm for Christ don't. This is why. You ready? John 12, verse 43 Literally, they love the glory of men more than the glory of God. That's it. And with those words, John 12, 43, Jesus cuts like a scalpel through to their fundamental motivation. Their issue was what they loved. But what exactly did Jesus mean? Did he mean they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God? Or did he mean they loved the glory of men more than the glory that is due to and should be ascribed to, that belongs to God? I suggest he means both. They loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God because they were blind to the true nature of the glory that is God's. Jesus said in John 5, I do not receive glory from people, but the Pharisees they clearly preferred the acclamation of others. That's what they lived for. Their lust for the approval of others made them forget to seek the approval of God. Friends, be warned. Indeed, their lust for the approval of others blinded them to God with their eyes on others, hungry for popularity and praise. They would never dare confess Christ or go against the crowd. Instead, said Jesus, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. So they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the places of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi. And in one sense, you could ask, how could they choose the approval of mere creatures over the approval of the Lord of glory? And when I put it like that, in black and white, of course you see the choice is irrational and idiotic. And yet, it's a choice we all fall into the whole time. They preferred the glory of man because God was not sufficiently glorious in their eyes. And therefore, they would abandon God for man every time. In 1677, Henry Skugel wrote a famous work, 
the life of God in the soul of man. It was a work that some 50 years later convinced George Whitfield of his need to be born again. And Skugel said, true religion is more than a matter of orthodox opinions. It's more than a matter of moral behavior. It's more than a matter of great emotional experiences. It is, he said, a delightful and affectionate sense of the divine. A delightful, affected sense of the divine that makes the soul resign itself to him, desiring above all things him, and being ready to do or suffer anything for his sake. The Pharisees lacked that, that delightful, affectionate sense of the divine. Instead, the Pharisees had a delightful and affectionate sense of themselves. They didn't appear in their own eyes to be great sinners. And therefore, Christ did not appear to them to be a great savior. He was not glorious to them. So, not perceiving the extent of God's love and compassion, they turned to find love and acceptance elsewhere. Instead of looking up to the glory and grace of God, they looked down. They looked down at the text they sought to master. They looked down at others for approval. They looked down on others in competition. Impressed more by themselves and by others than by a God who didn't seem very relevant. Since he wasn't a great savior to them didn't seem to do much for them. They cared more for what others thought than what God thought. Blind to the gloriousness of God, of course they were more impressed with their own glory and sought more from others. Their spiritual short-sightedness imprisoned them in the hamster wheel of people-pleasing. Do you struggle with that? Here's the answer. In contrast to the Pharisees, God is the glory, the portion, the treasure, the reward of true faith. Romans 4.20, Abraham grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. David cries in Psalm 3, You, O Lord, are my shield about me, my glory. Where the Pharisees look for some other reward, the saints declare, the Lord is my portion. Which is why Paul could write in Galatians 1, am I now seeking the approval of man? Am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Friends, those who don't perceive the glory of God, the beauty of His glory. They do not truly know Him, and so they will not live for Him. They'll live for other things. Augustine famously wrote in The City of God, his great work, that humanity divides over this issue into two cities. And these two cities, he explained, 
have been formed by two loves. The earthly city by a love of self, even to hatred of God. The heavenly city by love of God, even to contempt of self. The earthly glorifies in itself the latter, the heavenly in the Lord. The earthly seeks glory from men, but the greatest glory of the heavenly is God. The earthly lifts up its head in its own glory. The other says to God, you are my glory and the lifter up of my head. Heavenliness or worldliness? Faithfulness or cowardice? Friends, everything depends on where glory is found and enjoyed. Where do you find, where do you enjoy glory? Now, of course, loving the glory of men more than the glory of God is an itch we all know. We feel it inside us, we see it around us. So if you're feeling, yes, oh, the glory of men, the people pleasing, that is a problem for me. What can we do about it? How can we get out of the hamster wheel and find a happy resilience and courage? How can we do that? Because we want that. What hope is there? There is one. First Timothy 1.11, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. The gospel is the means by which you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the gospel reveals it is the deepest revelation of the glory of God enabling us to see a wonderful, superior beauty in God, far above, far more satisfying than any human glory. And when your eyes are open to see the superior beauty and worth and satisfaction of God's glory, then you will love the glory of God more than the glory of men. And you will find yourself strong and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Friends, it is through pressing into the gospel that you will see the glory that surpasses the glory of men. It is pressing into no God that will make you want Him more than popularity and praise. And so transform you from the sort who will cave in as soon as people are against you to one who will always stand for God because He's more glorious to you. That will give you the strength to stand firm and not be frightened. And because the Pharisees didn't do that, they didn't know God's glory. You see, the Pharisees, they completely misunderstood glory. They thought glory was a, a fame, an applause, a clapping to be got from people. And oh, how they wanted that. But if that's what glory is, a fame to be acquired from others, then, well, if that's what God's about, if God's just an eager, needy little being desiring, please clap me, please need me and appreciate me, well, God's a, a burden, not a delight then. And if He's always needy of our attention, then we'll prefer the glory of men to Him, if He's just a burden. 
But Jesus repeatedly told his disciples, I do not seek my own glory. Rather, it is my Father who glorifies me. You see, the one who is the very glory of God does not seek or need the glory of men. Instead, he's glorified by his Father. And how? What is the hour of his glorification? His self-giving death that bears much fruit. It is in the riches of his grace that we see the riches of his glory. And so, you see, this God's glory is not a preening, grasping glory. The glory of Jesus is the radiance of the Father, one so superabounding in life and blessedness that He generates glory without any need or lack. His is the glory of the overflowing fountain of life. In polar contrast to our sinful understanding of grabbing glory, in Christ crucified, we see a divine glory that shines into our darkness, that confers life and goodness, that gives righteousness to helpless, unworthy sinners. As Martin Luther put it, rather than seeking its own good, the love of God flows forth and bestows good. And therefore, how relevant, he could have written this this year, therefore, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. Thus Christ says, I came to call not the righteous but sinners. He carries on, this is the love of the cross which turns in the direction where it does not find good that it may enjoy, but where it, where it may confer good upon the bad and the needy. Here in God is a glory infinitely more lovely than the needy, grasping glory of idols and sinners. Never would we have dreamed that God would be so beautifully different to us. But it is only in the face of Christ, in the hour of His glory, that we begin to understand the goodness of divine glory. The glory of God starts becoming beautiful good news to us. And so Jesus said, John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will know that I am. You will know what God is like when you see him lifted up. Only then, in the beautiful face of Christ, will we begin to love the glory of God more than the glory of men. The English reformer Thomas Cranmer, who was burned on that same spot after Ridley and Latimer a few months later, he wrote, the doctrine of salvation by Christ alone advances and sets forth the true glory of Christ and beats down the vain glory of man. Because in the face of Christ, especially Christ crucified, we see the depth of our sin and the height of His mercy. And so we see we have nothing to glory in in ourselves. We see 
we contribute nothing to our standing before God. We're not impressive. And so we simply cannot boast in ourselves or haughtily compare ourselves with others. And if we do boast in ourselves, it just betrays our blindness to the reality revealed in the cross. Because why would Christ have died if we could glory in ourselves? But in the face of Christ crucified, we see the glory of God's mercy and righteousness. In the glory of Christ the Savior, we see captivating great-heartedness. There, friends, is the only glory that can transcend the siren song of human glory. Dear friends, it is the sight of the holy graciousness of God shown in Christ that is what has always given the saints the strength to stand firm. It is this sight that has surpassed the appeal of human approval and turned lambs into lions. This is not some natural courage that some stout-hearted folk are born with. It's not some natural inner strength some believers happen to have. So John Calvin, Charles Spurgeon, they both confess their natural inclination to be timid and fearful. That's how they were born. But as they grew in their appreciation of God, they became lions in the cause of the gospel and God's word. So this is not a strength for the few. Here, friends, is a strength available for all the saints. Timid saints, fearful saints, anxious saints, people pleasers. Here's the strength you need that will heal you and transform you. Found in growing to enjoy the glory of Christ. And take one of the most famous examples of Christian stout-heartedness. Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521. What bravery! There, standing before the emperor, with all the power of Europe and the Roman Catholic Church marshaled against him, refusing to give up what Scripture plainly taught, Luther cried, I am bound by the Scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot, I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Now, you hear that and you think, what was the fire in his bones that enabled him to do that, pushing him to what he knew was a death sentence? And he says that. What, what was in him? Well, just a few moments before he spoke those famous words, he'd explain to the emperor exactly what drove him. Here it is. He said, We ought to think how marvelous and terrible is our God, lest we begin condemning the Word of God. It is knowing the marvelousness of God that stops us from betraying the Word of God. Or let me take you back to Hugh Latimer, the preacher we saw earlier dying in Oxford in the flames with such bold cheer. 
Now, a few years before that, Latimer explained what strengthened him, what gave him courage. Latimer, he was due to preach before King Henry VIII. Whew, that fearsome king of many wives, many mistresses, of hot temper and zero tolerance. And Latimer decided to preach on the text, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. <laughs> and before the king, he held back nothing. He spoke plainly what God's word says concerning the guilts of lust. When he was done, the king said, next time you are to preach, which was to be the next Sunday, you will apologize and eat your own words. Latimer thanked the king and left. And the next Sunday came and he got into the pulpit and he said, Hugh Latimer, thou art this day to preach before the high and mighty Prince Henry, King of Great Britain and France. If thou sayest one single word that displeases his majesty, he will take thy head off. Therefore, mind what thou art at. But then he said, Hugh Latimer, thou art this day to preach before the Lord God Almighty, who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. And so tell the king the truth outright. And he did. And the king respected him for it. He loved the glory of God more than the glory of men. Fear him, ye saints, and ye will have nothing else to fear. The glory of God in the face of Christ has always been the lodestar and guiding light of reformation and faithfulness in the church. When Christians have appreciated God as all-sufficient, all-beautiful, all-satisfying, They've been strengthened and made fruitful. Even the timid ones. And for them, the world is not enough. Its glory and acclaim pale beside the splendor and the allure of Jesus Christ. May I finish with an insight from Song of Songs? Song of Songs is a book with two main characters, the lover and the beloved. The bridegroom and the bride. The lover, the bridegroom, is a shepherd king, the son of David. He stands at the door and knocks. In chapter 5, his carriage in chapter 3 looks like the temple. And like the Lord in the Exodus, he comes up from the wilderness like a column of smoke. That's what the bridegroom is like. He's perfumed with the scents of the temple. And the bride, the beloved, is described as being like Israel coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her lover, like Israel in the Exodus. She's compared to a vineyard, like Israel. She's compared to Jerusalem. And here's the verses I want you to see. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 4 and 10. He says to her, you are Beautiful as Tirzah, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Verse 10, who is this? 
who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. The bride is like an army. She's bright like the sun with the reflected beauty of the moon. From the shy, embarrassed girl you meet at the beginning of the book, she has become awesome. And so it is with the Bride of Christ. As Moses' face reflected the glory of the Lord, so the church comes to reflect the bridegroom's radiance and awesomeness. We know from the Apostle Paul that believers are being transformed into the image of God from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But here we see the bride's transformation is a growth in reflected awesomeness like the bridegroom, the church becomes awesome as an army with banners. When God's people, the church, love Christ and look to Him, they change from being weak, frightened, vacillating. They begin to exhibit to the world fearsome divine qualities, reflecting the glory of the Lord. They become holy, blessed, happy, whole, beautiful in Christ-likeness. And so the church shines like the moon in the world, in the darkness. Adoring Him, believers become like their God, blessedly, beautifully, fearsome. Dear friends, press in to know Christ better. Press in to enjoy the holy beauty of His glory so that you love the glory of God more than the glory of men. For if we love the glory of God more than the glory of men, then however testing the days to come may be, we will shine with valiant faith, awesome as an army with banners. Then we will be of good cheer like Latimer and Luther as we face down opposition and temptations to abandon God's word. And then, friends, the days of hard testing will, in the pages of church history, shine as among the brightest days of glory. And so now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the glory of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. That was Dr. Michael Reeves with a call to stand firm in God's truth. Dr. Reeves is one of many contributors to Table Talk, Ligonier's monthly devotional. For 45 years, this magazine has helped Christians take their Bible study deeper so they can apply the Word of God to their lives. If you still aren't a subscriber to Table Talk, you can try it out for free. Visit TryTableTalk.com to receive the magazine for three months in a row with no cost to you. No credit card information is needed, so it's a no-risk trial. We're taking a break here in Orlando, but we'll be back at 2.30 Eastern Time with our next Q&A session. I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I'll see you back here this afternoon.